I, I've pasted the link into the chat here. Please grab, okay, Waylon says sounding good, awesome. Pasted the link into the chat here. Please, if you would grab that uh, repo here, that's the content for our course. Um, so um, I'll just show you how I would do this. I've got a directory here. I'm, I'm assuming that you already have pandas installed and, um, uh, <clears throat> And Jupiter, oh, we're going to be using pandas and Jupiter. Uh, I've got a link there to, to help you do that if, if you don't have those installed, but I'm going to assume that you do. Um, and if you don't, you can just pip install pandas and space notebook and uh, that, that should work. So I'm going to say git uh, clone and I'm going to come up here and uh, clone this repo here. Okay, and um, I've got Jupyter running. So this is where that repo is and this is the notebook. So you can open that up and you should be good to go. Um, let me just ask a question of our audience here since we are you, so this is a web conference um, and we're going to be doing Jupyter. I'm, I'm just wanna make sure I'm aware, uh, familiar with how aware you are of using Jupyter. Um, so um, if you've used Jupyter, can you please like indicate with a thumb up? So I, I know that you're good with Jupyter. If you've never used Jupyter, can you like indicate with a thumb down in, in chat? That would be great for me just to see where we are there. Okay, so Glenn says they are good. Okay, so um, this is a hands-on course, so I, I do want you to participate. So um, um, I'm, I'm just gonna briefly show you the commands for Jupyter, uh, given that I'm not sure how many people have used Jupyter before, but Jupyter is a modal environment. We've got these cells, you can sort of arrow up and down between them. And if you hit H, uh, you're going to bring up this keyboard shortcut. There's a bunch of keyboard shortcuts here. You don't need to know most of them. For purposes of this class, uh, you'll want to know how to make a new cell. And so to make a new cell, there's two commands that I like to use, uh, A and B, which is going to make a cell above, and B will make a cell below your current cell. Um, and um, you have copy cut paste semantics here, uh, X, C, and B. These work at the, because this is a modal environment, when you're in command mode, you don't have to hold down control or command. You just hit X, C, or B to copy cut and paste the cell at that level. Um, you can um, interrupt the kernel, restart the kernel. Hopefully we don't have to do that. Hit I twice to interrupt the kernel. That stops whatever cell you're running. It turns out that how Jupyter works, it send, you, when you execute a cell, it sends that cell and it only runs one cell at a time. You can queue up multiple cells to run, but only one will run at a time. If you hit zero, zero twice, that will restart your kernel. You might uh, need to do that, hopefully not, but that if you, you'll you lose any state that you have when you do that. And um, yeah, to run a cell, you hold down control and hit enter. So that, that's kind of it. I, I mean, there are a bunch of other commands, but uh, you don't really need to know about those. Um, then there's also this edit mode down here. This is when you hit enter on a cell, the outline around the cell goes green and you, you can type things into it. And so you, we do have tab completion. So I'll probably show some of that. And you can also pull up a tool tip by hitting shift tab. Um, and if you hold down control and hit enter, it will execute that cell as well. So that's that's basically your commands there. Um, okay, I'm gonna get going. Um, so uh, let's run this first cell, just to hold down control and hit enter and it, it should run. Um, now, if, also, if, you're, if you aren't able to run Jupyter on your machine for whatever reason, you can take this code and you can load it in um, Google Colab, which is an online notebook environment if you have a Google account and it should work there. I did test it there. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna, you know, you, you should have pandas installed. Um, you probably want matplotlib as well. Once you've installed pandas, um, you can look at the version of that. I'm using version 1.32. 
um, not the absolute latest and greatest, but pretty recent version. Do you have to use um, Do you have to use Pandas um, uh, 1.32? No, you don't. This code should work with most recent versions of Pandas. Uh, at, and by reason, I mean like 0 0.24. Um, so you can also run the show versions. This is a little option to just uh, watermark your uh, versions of libraries that you have running here. Okay, so you can see that there, there's a bunch of, uh, this just gives me information. I'm, I'm running on Linux. Um, so I'm, I'm on a Windows machine, but using Windows sub or Linux subsystem there. And you can see the different versions of NumPy and Pandas and whatnot. Okay, so that, that's a basic library here. Um, so for our course, we're going to be um, looking at tweet metrics. I'm going to be going over uh, metrics from my Twitter stream. Uh, hopefully, this is somewhat interesting to you. Um, I tried to find a data set that, that might be somewhat relevant. Um, but the, the, what we're going to talk about today is, is not uh, Twitter specific per se. So it, it applies to most data that I've run across. So uh, as was mentioned, I've, I've taught pandas and, and done pandas as consulting um, almost since it came out. I've written three books on pandas and um, what we're going to talk about today are, are some best practices for, for dealing with pandas code. And so I do like using this Twitter data set in that it's a real world data set. So you'll see, uh, you know, this is not just random data that we're gonna be manipulating, but we're gonna be manipulating uh, real world data and seeing how to analyze it. Now, if you run these cells up here, they won't work because you don't have the this code, uh, the CSV files on your machine. So instead we can just skip to this load data from the web here. And if you hold down control and hit enter, um, that should load that and you should have this uh, variable called DF here. Um, so DF, uh, short for data frame, and uh, this is a uh, the main data structure in pandas. So we have a data frame. It's got an index that's sitting in the, uh, on the left hand side. That's bold here. We've got columns, and then uh, each of the columns has information in it. So this is Twitter information. Uh, a little bit about Jupiter. Um, so this thing on the left hand side here, uh, I can click that. If I click it, it expands. If I and if I click it, it goes to a window. Uh, I, I kind of like to leave it as a window, especially when I'm showing people on the web, because I can sort of scroll through it this way. So you can see that we've got a bunch of columns here. You can also see that there's some ellipses in the middle here. So it's not showing all of the columns, uh, just some of them. And uh, we've got some missing values here, Nan. If you scroll down, you can see that there's ellipses in the row here. So this is showing the first uh, five rows and the last five rows. If you scroll down to the bottom here and to the left, it tells you that there's uh, 5,791 rows and 40 columns there. Okay. Um, so we're going to do the first exercise now. The first exercise is making sure you can load the data. So this is your chance to get help if you need help loading the data or have any questions about that. So I'll just um, uh, give you a, a minute or two to do that. If you need help or have questions, please use the chat. If you're done with it, you can just indicate that you're done with, with a thumb up there. That will just help me to know that uh, you're sort of done and ready to move on. And if you have questions or concerns, I'm happy to answer them. You can paste them in the chat. You can paste them in Slack or I'm, I'm fine if you want to vocalize them as well via Zoom.
Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that uh, we're good with this. So um, again, if you if you need help, uh, happy to answer your questions. But I'm gonna assume that we're good with this. So uh, load the data using the cell above. You should just um, uh, hold down Control and hit Enter. You might get an error if you didn't import the libraries, and so you you will want to make sure that you have imported pandas here because we're referring to pandas right there. Okay. Let's, let's keep cruising along then. So once you've loaded your data and then pandas, you saw that we just loaded CSV, common separated value files. But if, if you look at pandas, um, you can see PD and say read here and then say underscore and hit tab. There's some tab completion there. It's gonna tell you all the options for reading data that you have in pandas. So there's a bunch of options. You can read from SQL if you want or Excel um, or pickle files or JSON files. So you, um, lots of options, even reading from a clipboard. So if you went to a web page, you could like highlight a bunch of text and then you could say read from the clipboard. You can also read from HTML as well. This is really nice for like scraping things like Wikipedia or whatnot. If you hit, see a table there, just point pandas to that URL and pull off the data for that. Okay, um, so let's inspect our data here. And uh, just uh, again, we, we do have Twitter data. And so um, a couple definitions that might be useful. Impressions, that's the number of times people saw your tweet. Engagements, that's how many times people interacted with your tweet. So uh, this is a sum of the clicks, the replies, the retweets, and the likes. So it's a, a metric that sort of says, you know, how, how much people kind of liked your, your, your tweet. Um, and then get engagement rate. This is the number of engagements divided by impressions. So you might have a tweet that has a high engagement rate, but low impressions. You might have a tweet that has high impressions, but low engagement rate. And you know what you want to optimize for sort of depends on you. And again, this isn't a course on tweeting per se, but um, uh, you know I, I happen to think Twitter is a useful social media platform. And, and so this is actually includes a lot of analysis I've done on this. This is my tweet. These are my tweets. And this includes some analysis I've done on my tweets to sort of figure out for my audience, you know, what sort of tweets resonate with them and maybe how to be a better tweeter. Okay, so once you've got your data here, uh, one things I like to do is transpose it sometimes. So I'm actually going to do uh, the head 20 and then transpose that. So transposing, you just need to be careful with that. You may not be aware of that. That's a operation that takes uh, your table and it's gonna flip the rows and the columns. It comes from linear algebra. If you did some linear algebra, you might remember having like a matrix and you put a capital T uh, to the right of it. That means uh, flip it, transpose it. So we can do this. Uh, I do sometimes do this uh, with pandas because it lets me see a little bit more data. You can see that by transposing this, um, I can see a little bit more of the data. You do have to be careful with this because pandas, how it stores data is a little bit different than uh, maybe how you might naively think it does. So pandas, uh, Python's a slow language and you might think it's weird that like Python is somewhat popular for machine learning data science. And one of the reasons for that is this library called NumPy. NumPy basically gives you a C interface to working with uh, arrays of data, matrices of data. And so, you know, I could have a list of numbers representing age. And then if that was a Python list, there'd be some overhead for the list, but there'd also be overhead for each individual number because each of those would be a Python object. And, and as you know, Python objects have overhead. And so what NumPy does, it says, instead of making a list with Python objects in it, we're gonna make a list with a C buffer in it. And we're gonna say like, I'm gonna have 20, integers in it. So each of those integers is eight bytes. So it'd be, you know, 20 times eight, 160 bytes of information there, which, um, you know, it's probably about three uh, Python integers, uh, how, how much space three Python integers would take up. So by doing that, you compress, you have a bunch of memory savings, but also the other thing that NumPy can do is it can do vectorized operations using modern CPU architectures like SIMD. So if you wanna say, I wanna to add two to everything, I wanna see how old everyone will be in two years, you just say, uh, take this block and add two to it. We'll take the whole block and every number in it, it will add two to it and give you a new block in that place. Happens basically at the CPU level, so it's very fast. 
uh, versus if you were to do that in pure Python, you'd probably do something like a list loop or list comprehension and uh, update that. And you could do that, it would just be slow. So pandas built on top of NumPy and basically each column is basically a NumPy array. And so it can optimize that and you can do operations to columns that are quick. And it also won't take a lot of memory. However, when we take this data structure, the data frame and, and rotate it so that the rows and the columns are changed, we're basically saying, take each row and make it into a column. And if your types in your different columns are not homogenous, they're not the same type, then it makes Panda's uh, representation of the column now not as compact as it could be. So just be careful with that transpose. That's why I do like to do something like the head. If you had like a million rows and then you transposed it into um, a million columns that had mixed types, you might have a memory explosion where you'd use a lot more memory than the untransposed version of that would be. Okay, let's look at the shape of this. Um, well, I mean, one, the, one the, before I do that, one of the useful things about doing like a transpose here is I can see a little bit more information. So we've got like information about when I posted, the number of impressions, uh, you know, individual stats like retweets, replies, uh, clicks, uh, how many times people expanded it. And then there's a bunch of things like, did people dial their phone? Uh, did they view media? Did they open some app? Um, you know, and then there's a bunch of promoted information on there as well. I don't do promoted tweets. So those are all you can see NAN for missing values there. Okay, um, let's, uh, you can also say shape. Let's just look at the shape. This is a Python tuple. Uh, so 5,791 uh, rows and 40 columns. Another thing I like to do after I load, especially a CSV file, is look at the D types. Uh, the D types is the data types of each of the columns. So one thing you'll note here, or you, uh, you may not note, but uh, I'll just tell it to you, this gives us back a pandas series. So a pandas series, you can think about it as a single column from a data frame. Um, you, you might say that's not a column, it's got two columns. Well, this thing on the left here, we call that the index. So it's taken all of the columns and put them in the index. And then these are the values of the series here. And in this case, it's using the types as the values. So you can see that the tweet ID is at int64. We've got a bunch of objects. We've got a date time. We've got some floats. And we've got some int64s down here. Now, if you're not familiar with typing in, in pandas, these are not, again, uh, Python types. These are basically NumPy types. There is no int64 type in Python. So this is a, a NumPy type. It's saying that each integer here is taking eight bytes of memory. Um, the object, generally when you see an object type in Python or in pandas, what that means is it's pointing to a string. Uh, so pandas does not have an optimized representation for a string, but um, it just basically makes a NumPy array that points back to the Python objects, the Python string objects. Uh, also object could mean that it has mixed types. So if you have, you know, something that has strings and numbers and whatever, you can stick whatever you want to a pandas data frame. You're just not gonna get the speed and the improvements if it's not numeric per se. Uh, we can see that we have a date time 64. This is a new uh, a representation for a date here. We've got float 64, again, not a Python type, but a NumPy type. Now, just a, a quick note here, uh, when pandas reads a CSV file, it's gonna try and infer the correct type. CSV files are great in that they're all over the place and they're human readable, but that's about the extent of their greatness. Um, they don't have type information in them, which makes them somewhat um, problematic. And there are other issues like encoding issues and escaping issues that are problematic there as well. So pandas is going to try and infer the type there. And so you can see that it inferred like in 64 and float 64, but you might think like, um, you know, likes and uh, replies, why is that a float? That should be a whole number. So what's going on there? So it turns out that uh, pandas uh, does the int 64, lowercase int 64 type does not have support for missing numbers. So if, it ha if that column has a missing value, pandas is going to convert that uh, from an integer type to a float type. So by looking at the D types, you can, in addition to just seeing the types, you can infer some other things about the, this data. One is that, you know, anything that's integer in int64 does not have missing data. Um, anything that's float could be floating point, 
it could be floating point with missing data and it could be integer like, but it had missing data. So it got coursed into a float. Why do I care about missing data? You might not care about missing data, but if you're gonna do something like machine learning later, probably wanna be aware of it because many machine learning algorithms do not work if you have missing values. So that might be something that you have to, to uh, clean up. Okay. Um, uh, you can also note that uh, pandas does have options for uh, interacting with like Jupyter, and you can see that the maximum columns that it says it wants to display is 20. So you can change that if you want to. Um, alternatively, you can use a context manager here in combination with the IPython display function here to temporarily change that. So I'm going to say uh, temporarily show 240 columns. And if we do that, uh, we should see that it shows all of my columns here. There's no um, uh, ellipses in the middle here. So you, you can override that value there. Just be careful with that. I, I know sometimes people are like, oh, it says 20 and I've got something that has a thousand columns. So I wanna change that to a thousand. Really, you don't wanna view a thousand columns. Humans aren't optimized for that. And so if you feel that you have that tendency to want to change that to view more data, you're probably going to want to use a computer that is optimized for looking through large amounts of data or visualize it rather than scrolling through large amounts of data. So if you have that tendency to like, I wanna see more data, uh, maybe just second guess that and, and realize that you might not want to. Okay, and let me show you one more trick here. Um, so with pandas, I can, on the data frame, I can say is an A, and that will give me a data frame that is the same shape, but it's gonna have true and false values wherever something is missing. You see some true values over here, all these promoted were missing. Now, what we can do now is we can add an operation to that. I'm gonna do what's called a reduction or aggregation uh, method on that called sum. What this is gonna do, it's gonna collapse all of these columns along the index, that black bold thing on the left-hand side. And what it's gonna give me is a series and in the index of the series will be each of the column names and the value for that column will be the sum of the true values. You're probably aware that in Python, Python treats true as one and false as zero. So if this is a bunch of ones and zeros, this will tell us how many values are missing for each column. This is a nice little trick that we can do in pandas. Oops. And uh, there you can see that uh, most of these first ones aren't missing anything. And then the, the promoted ones seem to be missing a bunch of information there. Uh, let me show you one more trick here that we can do with that. Um, it's not on, on the uh, slides here. If we take the mean of this and multiply this by 100, instead of doing the count, this is gonna be the percent that is missing. So if you look at this, you can see that 100% of those are missing down there. So this is a nice little trick in pandas. Um, if you have something that is Boolean, you take the mean of it and multiply it by 100, that tells you the percent. If you sum it, that tells you the count of things that have that property. So in this case, I'm looking at is and a, but you don't just have to do is and a, you can do any Boolean that you want to. Okay, let's do the next exercise here. The next exercise is uh, use two methods that I didn't describe, but hopefully you can figure out how to use them. That's use describe to view the summary st statistics of the column and use the core method to look at column correlations. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Um, after you've done that, if you just hit the thumb up and let me know that you're good, uh, we'll keep proceeding. Okay, um, let me know if you had any questions about this. I'll just show how to do this. Um, hopefully you did something like this where you said DF, let's take the data frame. And I'm gonna hit D and hit tab here. We do have some tab completion. You can see that these are all the options that start with D here. The first one is describe. So 
I should be able to hit tab and then hit enter to get uh, completion on that. So if I just do df describe, that's a bound method. That's not what I want to do. Let me show you another feature of Jupyter. If I put a question mark here and run this, this is not valid Python code. If you're familiar with Python, you probably haven't seen something that looks like that. This is something that Jupyter understands. And what that does is it pops up this little window down here that gives us the documentation for that. So that's a nice little feature of Jupyter let you stay in the app and explore the documentation. So this is great for removing distractions. Also, it turns out that Pandas generally has pretty good documentation built into it. So it says that Describe gives us descriptive statistics. I can hit escape to dismiss that. Let's change that question mark here to uh, parentheses. And you can see that for every numeric column, I have the summary statistics. I have count, mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, and the inner quartiles there. Um, uh, just FYI, this count value here might not be what you think it means. It has a specific meaning in pandas land. Count means the number of non-null values. So um, we know that there are 5,791 entries here. So all of, all of those, um, uh, none of those are missing in that case. You can look over here and you can see that the count is zero for all these promoted things. Okay. Uh, the next one here is core. And so I'll just say DF. And again, I can say core with a question mark. That brings up the uh, documentation for that. Turns out that Panda or Jupyter has another trick up its sleeve. You can put a double question mark here. And instead of bringing up the documentation, it's going to bring up the source code for this. This is kind of cool. So I want to see what core does. And here it is. Here's the source code for it. Um, you can see that there's uh, starting to be some attempts at uh, adding some typing to uh, pandas. Um, and if you scroll down, you can see here's the source code for that. You can even see what file this is. So that's kind of nice. Um, again, highly recommend that if you're using um, uh, Jupyter, you try and use the documentation directly from Jupyter rather than high, jumping up to some search engine. And so here we go. Here is the correlation of all the numeric columns. So this is the Pearson correlation coefficient number between negative, zero, negative one and one. And so uh, the closer the values are to one, that means as one value goes up, the other value goes up. Now you do have ones along this diagonal here because that's the cross, the auto the self-correlation with column with itself. When a column goes up, it goes up. Um, but you can see things like this uh, right here. Uh, retweets tend to have a pretty high correlation with impressions as does engagements. So if you have more retweets, you have more impressions. Hopefully that makes sense, right? If people retweet your content, you would have uh, 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 more people viewing it. Okay. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna keep cruising along unless there are other questions. Uh, we talked about types a little bit. Again, you can pull off D types here. This gives you a series with the columns and their associated types. One thing you might want to be aware of is memory usage. So I can say memory usage on here, and this is going to give me the information for the memory usage. Again, we can pull up the documentation for that if we want to. I showed how to do that with a question mark. You can also do it by putting your cursor in here, holding down shift and hitting tab four times quickly. One, two, three, four pulls up this little window, which is basically the same as doing the question mark there. So this says return the memory usage of each column in bytes. Okay, so you can see that uh, the index is 128 bytes and uh, we've got 4, 46,000 bytes for tweet ID. Okay, and uh, because this is a pandas object, if we want to know the total number of bytes, we can just sum that up. And this looks like this is, uh, what's that? kilobyte, megabyte, 1.8 megabytes, I believe, uh, to represent this. Okay, so that's uh, kind of cool. It's going to pan all the way down. Now, um, it turns out that I kind of lied when I said memory usage. That wasn't actually the memory usage. Um, why is that? Well, um, we can pull up the documentation here again. And you can see that there's this deep is equal to a false here. And if you go down here, it says, if true, inspect, introspect the data deeply by interrogating object types for system level memory consumption, include it in the return values. So that's kind of vaguely worded, but basically what it means is that, um, you know, we've got some object type columns like uh, tweet text, and it says it takes 46,000 bytes here. However, that's 
the pandas object, not the Python objects that is pointing to. If we say deep is equal to true here, you can see that uh, that does take quite a bit more uh, amount of memory to store that because each tweet is being represented as a Python string. So I, I wish this is maybe one of my gripes. I wish this was the default behavior of pandas to show us how much memory it really takes, but um, it's the world we live in right now. So again, if you want to sum that up, you can sum that up and you can see that instead of what 1.9 uh, megabytes, it's actually taking about four megabytes to store this data here. Okay. Uh, now, one of the things you can do if, if you know, Pandas is a, I call it a small data, uh, no SQL uh, tool. What do I mean by that? Uh, small data, from, from my point of view, small data is data that will fit on a single machine. In order to use Pandas, you need to be able to load your data into memory. Um, so this is not a big data where big data is multiple machines. And so it is important, you know, if you get larger data sets to be aware of how much data they're taking up because you need to, be, if you're using pandas, you need to load them into memory to be able to manipulate them. Um, so that is, is something that you might want to be aware of. Um, and also due to the nature of how pandas works, you want to have some overhead as well. So I generally recommend to my clients that they have three to 10 times the amount of memory as the size of the data because they're gonna want a little bit of overhead for manipulating their data. Okay, so it, you might want to do further actions to either call out some of the columns or change the types to be a little bit more memory efficient. And uh, we saw that you can do in 64, but it turns out that NumPy has a bunch of other types and pandas can leverage those types as well. So let's do this operation here. I'm gonna say df select D types, and then I'm gonna do describe on that. So I'm gonna select all the integer types. And if you do that, this is just gonna give me a data frame that has all the integer columns here. And then I'm gonna do, do a describe on this. So this will give me summary statistics for just the integer columns. So you can see I'm chaining these operations together to first to do some filtering and then do some summarization as well. So the interesting part about this is I can look at like the max row down here and you can see the max app opens is three. Um, and you can see that basically this is, you know, almost all the values are empty. You can see by the quantiles here that most of those are zero. So probably not, particularly concerned about app opens, neither app installs, everything's zero, so there's no information in there. Uh, follows, pretty skewed data. We do have, um, you know, the max value is 191. Uh, email tweets, zero. Dial phone, zero. Uh, media views, pretty skewed as well. We've got one that goes up to 16,000. And then my face is including this one over here. Uh, media engagements goes up to 16,000 as well. So it turns out that I'm using a 64-bit uh, integer to represent these values. A lot of them I can just drop and uh, every, uh, the other ones I can change to a different uh, type to conserve more space. You can see that the, the minimum values of all these um, except for tweet ID, the minimum values of all of these are um, zero. So pandas and NumPy have both signed and unsigned integers. So I could actually use um, an unsigned integer to represent this because I don't really have any, it doesn't make sense to have a negative follow. Well, I guess you could have a negative follow, but tw Twitter doesn't report that, that you actually lost followers by tweeting. So, uh, I could change the types there to optimize that. Similarly, I can do the same thing with float here. I'm gonna say, let's uh, select uh, the float 64 types. Uh, I believe I should be able to do this with this up here. Some versions of uh, pandas, this one up here might not work, but um, so, you know, here's the summary statistics for all the float columns. And uh, there are different float types in pandas as well. So you might want to, uh, realize that you can change those. But interesting thing for me here is you look at things like engagements, impressions. Um, these, if you look at the quantiles here, don't look floating point-ish, they look uh, integer-like. So for some reason, pandas is representing these as floating points. They probably should be integers. And you know this only goes up to 45,000, so, and it's not negative. So we could optimize that a little bit without any loss of fidelity there. Uh, similar with retweets, replies, likes, um, and these other ones. There's a bunch of floating point values in here that are actually integers that we probably would want to change. 
Um, and then we have a bunch of missing values as well that we want to just drop. So by, by doing these sorts of operations, we can optimize um, how much data we're using there. Okay, so let's like just, if you look at this impressions here, it looks like that could be integer lag. So I'm gonna try and convert that to an integer. I can say as type int, let's just throw that into an int. And uh, it looks like that worked, it didn't complain. And I was able to convert that to an integer. So we can probably convert a lot of these columns to integers without problem. The way I like to update is I use the assign method. So this is a, a super powerful method. And I think it's key for understanding how to use if you want to use pandas effectively. And so uh, the, and let's just pull up the documentation here for assign. You can see that it uh, assigns new columns to a data frame. That's a little bit vague because it doesn't really uh, describe what it's doing. Um, this says it returns a new object with all the original columns in addition to new ones. Existing columns that are reassigned will be overwritten. So this is a key point here. Assign does not mutate a data frame, rather it returns a new data frame. And that's actually the behavior of a lot of things in pandas. So, um, um, you know, uh, pandas generally does not mutate, rather it returns a new data frame. That's why we do want to have a little bit of overhead for that. And so how we use this is we call it, it's a method, and then we're gonna pass in the name of the column and assign it to the new value, okay? And if it's an existing column, it will return a new data frame with that new value. Note that it won't change the original data. And so let's just try and convert impressions and engagements um, to integers, and let's see if that works here. And it looks like that did work. If it didn't work, it would complain, it would give us an error here. Okay, and so uh, I could do this with a bunch, you know, I, um, a bunch of columns. I could just say, okay, all these columns that are integer like, we could convert them to integers, and I could have a lot more of those columns here. Um, that might get a little bit tedious to do. So, uh, you know, why, if I've got a bunch of columns that I want to convert to numbers, um, is there a better way? Well, we do have loops in Python, and, and people use loops to do things that computers are good at that are humans find annoying, right? It's annoying to type out the same thing if I don't want to. So wouldn't it be cool if I could just pull out the integer columns and then convert them, or the, the certain columns and convert those to integers here? So I could do something like this. Um, um, well, one of the things I, I do need to be aware of, because this is using a method and it's using keywords in Python, I, I, in order to use this style, you kind of have to have columns that are valid keywords. And, and for example, uh, engagement rate here, if I run this, um, actually fails, I get a syntax error because it's not in a valid keyword, it's got a space in it. So if you look up here, you can see engagement rate has a space in it. So that's, that's going to be problematic for trying to use this. So one of the things I might want to do is I might want to rename my columns. So there is a method called rename. So I'm going to say rename, and this can take a function, and the function will take the current name of a column and return a new column. So I'm using a lambda here, but uh, this is just taking the current name, and it's uh, replacing spaces with underscores. So if I do that, um, you can see that it gives me back a data frame. And you can see that it has engagement underscore rate. Now, same story goes on here. This is not changing the original column or the original data frame. If I come down here and look at DF, uh, the original DF uh, still has spaces in there. So this did not change that. Rather, it returned a new data frame with that. Um, I can also do things like this where I say, let's uh, filter out promoted here. And here are all of the promoted ones. These are the ones I want to drop. So um, let me just start cleaning this up a little bit. I'm going to make this chain here where I'm going to say, uh, and I'll just, uh, so this is a chain, what I'm doing here. I put parentheses around this code here. This is, this is a little bit weird if you're used to normal Python code, but you, you'll see this in pandas uh, a bit. Uh, I'm using parentheses to basically make a parenthetical. Parentheses mean a bunch of things in Python. In this case, I'm making a parenthetical, but you may or may not be aware that when you open a parenthesis or a square bracket or a curly brace in Python, you basically don't have to worry about white space rules anymore. So what this allows me to do is put each of these option operations on a single line. So I'm gonna start off with my data frame. So here's my data frame. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say drop and I'm gonna drop any column that has promoted in it using a list comprehension here. 
And so if you look at this, uh, if we scroll over here, this no longer has those promoted ones at the end. Okay, again, this did not mutate the original DF, it's returning a new one. And then on this, I'm gonna rename the, the remaining columns here. So here we go. I now have this uh, data frame here that has uh, the fixed columns. And then if I wanted to, I could do like a describe on this. And this is the, the current uh, summary statistics for the numeric columns that have been renamed and um, filtered out the promoted ones. Okay, and then I could go through here and sort of say, uh, okay, like engagements should be numeric, right? Uh, or it should be integer-like, and we can figure out those sizes of those. Um, now, just be careful when you start chaining these things up because you can run into issues. For example, in this case, I'm going to rename, and then I'm going to do a drop here. So uh, let's do that, and I get a key error. Um, the issue here is that here I'm renaming these, and these, if you look at the end here, these have promoted underscore now instead of space. And then this drop here, if you look at the drop, I'm using a list comprehension, but I'm using the original DF right here. So that's problematic. The original DF, the columns in the original DF don't have underscores in them. So I'm trying to drop columns with underscores from one that doesn't have underscores. And hence I get this error here, the key error, and it says, whoops, um, it says these columns did not exist in there. So <clears throat> that's uh, somewhat problematic, right? And if we look at the, doc the um, documentation for drop, you can see that um, you can pass in a single label or a list like, and uh, so, In our case, um, you know, if we want to pass in a list of those labels, we would have to pass in the ones that had uh, the underscores with them. Um, alternatively, I can do something like this though. Uh, Python or Pandas has a pipe method. And the pipe method is a powerful method that lets us basically say, I want to dispatch to a function with the current state of the data frame here. So in this case, I'm going to say I want to dispatch to this drop column, and the pattern is promoted. And so my, the current state of my data frame, which has the renamed columns, will come in here. And then I'm also passing in this promoted pattern. And then look at this. And here, I'm saying let's do a drop. And I'm dropping off the DF underscore, which is the current state of the data frames. And this actually will work, and it will drop off those promoted ones. So by leveraging that pipe, I get to take advantage of the current state of the data frame instead of that. Um, uh, alternatively, I can do this with a Lambda and I don't even have to define a function. I've commented that out there, but I can do that with a Lambda as well. So this would be a way for me to, uh, after I've changed the column names, to be able to use a list comprehension on the updated column names because I don't have, like if I refer to DF inside of this chain, the DF inside this chain refers to the original data, not the updated data. Okay, and so here, here I'm gonna drop promoted. I'm also gonna drop these other ones as well. Let's just run that and make sure that it works and it does work. Now, another note about this chain here is it starts to read like a recipe. You can read step by step. These are all the steps that I'm doing in here. Note that I'm also working with my raw data and so this is really cool. When you do an analysis, your boss comes to you and wants you to explain something. If you're not working with the raw data, you're working with some intermediate state, it's hard to track what's going on. But in this case, I can look through this and I can step through every step that's going on in my code here. So uh, really powerful once you start getting used to it. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna rename, and then I'm going to drop promoted columns. I'm gonna drop these other columns, and then let's look at the memory usage of that. And so I make sure I look at that, and we're uh, down to three here. I think we're at four before. So, uh, you know, we saved a quarter of our memory by doing that. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit of time uh, to try uh, this column cleanup exercise says use loc to select impressions and engagement columns. Uh, use uh, drop to select Im impressions and engagement columns and use rename to rename impressions to imp and engagements to ENG. 
So just want to give you a chance to realize that there are multiple ways to do things in Pandas. You can do things with loc, you can do things with drop, and you can do things with rename. I'll give you a few minutes to try this out. If you need help or have questions, let me know. Um, happy, happy to address those. Uh, so Rosa says, where do I get uh, the work, the notebook here? So the notebook is on the GitHub here. Paste that in here, right here. You can go and you can clone that if you want to, and you should be good. Okay, I'll just give you a couple minutes to work on that. Let me know if you need help. Okay, Glenn asks a question. Glenn says, is each DF return during a long chain of methods a deep copy of the original data frame? Uh, that's a good question. Um, deep copy, it depends. Uh, sometimes pandas can do smart things, but generally um, your operations, Glenn, in pandas do not mutate the original data frame, rather they return a new object. Um, so, that's just the way pandas works. Uh, but you know what's going to happen is as you're going through this chain, the intermediate uh, state is basically going to be garbage collected for you because no one's using the intermediate state, right? So there is some overhead for that intermediate state. That's why I do like to say you want to have three to 10 times the amount of memory. But Python will garbage collect those for you and you won't have to worry about those. A lot of people, I see a lot of people who don't use chaining, who write, um, and certainly you don't have to use chaining, but they'll just write each individual step and they'll make like an intermediate variable pointing to that, which um, for me is just sort of visual noise, but it's also memory consumption, right? Because if you're making an individual variable to hold each of the intermediate steps, uh, there's a variable point to it. So Python will not garbage collect it. So you'll be consuming more memory by doing that. Great question. Okay, um, let's go over this uh, column cleanup exercise. So um, note it says, please don't mutate here. So there are uh, options that will try and do an in place and mutate it. And so I, I don't want to do that. I just want to, um, um, you know, do one of these chains here. So the first one is use loc to select the impressions and engagement column. Whoops. Um, okay. So um, so we got df here, and we want to pull off impressions and engagements. So how would I do that? Um, turns out that there's also a loc selector here. This is a little bit weird. Uh, loc allows you to index off of it. And I can say, I want to pull off uh, colon here. This is going to be the row indexer. So there's gonna be all of the rows here. And let me see if there's documentation for loc here. I don't know if there, what the documentation. Yeah, so. So yeah, loc is a property. You can see that it pulls up the property here. So I'm not sure why the question mark doesn't work. Sometimes Jupyter is flaky like that, but I'll push shift and then hit tab after that, it pulls up the documentation for the property here. So you can get that documentation there. But uh, uh, so this is a property that you index off of. And I'm gonna say colon here, this is gonna be the row indexer. This is a little bit weird from normal Python. Normal Python, when you slice on something, you just pass in a slice. In NumPy and Pandas, because they're multi-dimensional, like a data frame is two-dimensional, you can slice along the index. You can also slice along the columns here. So this is saying, this colon here is saying, take all the rows. And now I'm gonna take uh, for columns, I want to take impressions 
and uh, engagement. And when we do that, um, it, I'm getting an error here. And um, why am I getting an error? Do, do, do. Shouldn't be getting an error. I probably spelled something wrong. Yeah, because it's engagements. There you go. OK, so th this is giving me uh, this data frame here. So uh, I mean, sort of going back to Glenn's question, right? I mean, it doesn't really need to make a deep copy here to do this loc because it's just basically a view of that, um, a, a subset of that. Okay, the next one here, drop, use drop to select impressions and engagements. So uh, in pandas, there's multiple ways to do things and, and uh, you can do something like this where I say, I wanna drop, I'm gonna say um, columns and I'll use a list comprehension. Columns is equal to C for C in DF, if C not in, and maybe we'll just take this impressions and engagements list and stick that up here. So if it's not in this list, drop it. Okay, so that's, that's one way to do that as well. Um, you know, which one of these is better? It sort of depends, right? In this case, because I only have two columns, I'd probably prefer to use this one. Um, but if I had a bunch of columns I need to filter out, um, a list comprehension can be useful in that case. Okay, and then the next one, uh, rename. Use rename to rename impressions to imp and engagement to ENG. So I showed you rename passing in a function. It turns out that if you pull up the documentation for rename, um, this, uh, I said columns is equal to, so this is a little bit weird. Um, columns, it says uh, alternate to specifying mapper access equals one. So uh, it turns out that originally this rename only had this mapper and then you specified an, an axis, which means uh, along the index or along the columns. So you want to do some renaming of the index or the columns. And then they were like, most people that doesn't make sense to say map or an access. Why don't you just say columns and specify the columns or index and specify the index. So uh, that's, they changed it later on. But anyway, a mapper is either a dictionary or function. So I can say rename and then I can say columns is equal to, and I can say, I want to rename uh, impressions to imp and engagements I can spell uh, <clears throat> engagements to ENG. Okay, and if you see that, um, that one worked. Uh, it didn't change engagements because I've got a typo here. So let me fix my typo. And now you see imp and ENG were renamed there. Again, this did not mutate the original data frame. Uh, it is returning a new data frame with the updated columns there. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions there. So uh, there is uh, my uh, examples for this assignment here. Okay, um, let's see how we're doing with time. Looks like we're doing okay. I'm gonna keep cruising along then. Okay, so I, I, I sort of said I was doing types. I really didn't do much with types there. I just did column cleanup. Um, so usually when I have a data frame, the first thing I do like to do is clean up those columns. Um, just uh, as an aside, another thing that you get by renaming the columns is you get tab completion on them and you'll get better tab completion if the columns are um, uh, actually valid Python attributes. For example, um, here I can say engagements and I can say period and hit tab. And these are all of the things I can do with engagements. Um, uh, however, we, we do have like a, a tweet permalink here and I can't access that by a dot notation because it's not a valid Python attribute. I can access that by this index uh, access here. But when I try and do tab completion here, this fails. So this is a sort of a limitation of Jupyter per se. Um, it, it did pull up some options um, eventually, but uh, you, basically you'll get better tab completion if, if you rename your columns than you will if you, if you don't. 
Okay, so uh, let's look at uh, back to you know types here. I've got this chain, and let me just sort of comment or go through this, and let's let's figure out what's going on here. So here's my data frame. Okay, I'm going to rename my columns. And then I'm going to um, drop my promoted columns. You can't really see that that's going on here, but uh, before I do that, you can look over here and you see we got a bunch of promoted. And if you look at the size of this, we've got 40 columns. Let's just run this with the drop here and uh, hit control enter. And now we have 22 columns. So that did drop those promoted columns there. And then we've got things like tweet ID, um, permalink clicks, app opens. Uh, so I'm gonna get rid of this tweet ID column here. It turns out that permalink has the ID in it. So it's sort of superfluous information there. Uh, let's do that. Okay, and um, let's do a describe here. So on my remaining columns, let's look at summary statistics. Okay, so now that I have these summary statistics, if I want to change my numeric types to maybe a smaller, less memory, uh, uh, consuming type, I can. Uh, so for example, you can see like retweets, uh, you know, I, I didn't have anything that had more than 400 retweets. I didn't have anything that had more than 200 replies. So I, I'm using an eight byte integer. It's really overkill for those columns here. Now, one thing you can do with NumPy is you can say, okay, let's ask NumPy which pandas is leveraging uh, this I info. Again, you can pull up the documentation for this if you want to, but it's these are the machine limits for those types. So I can say, what does an integer 64 look like? And it looks like that. The minimum value is this and the maximum value is that, right? So you can change these and I can say like, well, what's an int eight, right? Uh, 127, or you can say, what's a U int eight, unsigned integer, it should go up to 255, right? So I can, I can use different types here and an int eight is going to store an eighth the amount of memory, right? And you can see U int 16, I can probably use that for a lot of things like a retweet here. So it's using a quarter the size of the memory and, and should be more than sufficient to represent uh, retweets and replies here. Famous last words, right? Who needs more than a, a U int 16? Um, for, I can probably say that with pretty good, uh, on my retweets here, but you know, maybe, you know, next year something will go viral and, uh, but you know, I hear, hear, you know, you can just do a loop here and you can look, look through these different sizes if you want to and see what makes sense. Okay. So after that, what I can do is I can do something like this, where I say, okay, let's, uh, we're dropping these. And then I want to like, uh, change impressions to a UN32 and engagements to a, a UN16, right? So uh, let's just run that and do a describe on that. And you can see that engagements and impressions, um, those values there um, look like they're, they're okay, right? Um, compared to what we're up here, uh, you know, this is 800,000 impressions and 45,000 engagements. So we've changed the type here to be, uh, you know, a quarter and half, and we haven't lost any fidelity with that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we can do that for various columns here. Um, one thing you need to be, so, so I have various columns, I might want to make a for loop in there. And so this is one place where you need to tread carefully. Um, so here I'm going to loop over all of my float columns, I'm going to print the column, and then I'm going to make this dictionary that has um, uh, convert the column as an integer, right? And so something like this. And um, I, it looks like I got an error here, like casting one of these columns that says uh, you cannot convert uh, NA to an integer. So some of these columns here that are floats, I can't convert to integers uh, as they are because they have missing values. Um, so I, I need to be careful with that, but maybe um, some of them I, I can. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, in my assign, and maybe you're familiar with this star star operation here. So it turns out you can use a double star in front of a dictionary in a call to a method or a function and Python will unpack the arguments in there. So um, I've got a dictionary comprehension here. I'm looping over uh, my data frame. I'm saying, um, uh, <clears throat> Um, um, so here, here is my uh, dictionary comprehension and saying, uh, let's map C to this uh, data frame here for every C in replies, hashtag, and follows. So let's run that. And that looks like that works. So reply, hashtag, clicks, and follows. Let's just inspect that if we can. So replies, 
Uh, let's see, where's hashtag clicks, hashtag clicks and follows. Looks like um, uh, we got like one reply here, hashtag clicks. That looks like that. That did an okay job. Okay. Um, now, one of the things you, you'll note here is that I did do this little in my Lambda here. This is a little bit weird. I did a C is equal to C. So I'm, I'm mapping the column name to a Lambda. The, the reason I'm mapping it to a Lambda here is because I get um, the current state of the data frame. So uh, rather than using the original DF, who knows what my column names are at this point. And so this, this Lambda here allows me to get the current state of that. So that's kind of cool that uh, Pandas allows you to stick in a Lambda there, makes for a little bit more uh, maybe visual noise, but it actually it, it gives you a lot of power there. Now, if I don't put the C is equal to C there, if I just put, you know, we're mapping C to this uh, Lambda here, uh, without that, and we try and run this, and we look at like, you can see I'm doing this for units eights and units sixteens. And if we look at retweets, likes, user profile clicks, um, so here's retweets and likes. If you look at retweets, likes, and user profile clicks, um, the summary statistics, they're all the same now, which is somewhat disturbing because they weren't the same for retweets, likes, and user profile clicks. So this is actually, um, you know, why I put that C is equal to C up here. So we're sort of diving into like advanced Python here. Um, this is actually from the Python FAQ. If, if you go to that and there's a link to that here. But um, you know, if I'm doing a loop here and I'm appending a lambda into this, so I'm saying loop over a range of five and append uh, the square of X. And then we actually loop over that and call that uh, we get 16. This is due to the late binding of Python. You can look at the FAQ here. Um, so it's going to try and pull out the closure here with X. Well, the last value of X was four. So everything in there when you actually run that is that. Uh, contrast that with this code here where we say Lambda and then we do a default uh, variable that binds at the time of definition here. Um, and when we run this, uh, we get these values here. So that's why I do, if I'm using this Lambda here, um, I, I do need to put that C is equal to C. So I'm, uh, when it actually executes, it's using the right column name there. So here you can see that I said, let's make impressions uh, be a UN 16 or UN 32. Let's make engagements be a UN 16. And then I got a bunch of UN eights that I want and a bunch more of UN 16s that I want down here. Let's run that and just uh, double check the describe on that. And it looks like that is working. So, you know, do I have to use this special syntax here? No, I don't. I could write these out each as one line at a time there, that might be a little bit more clear to you. Um, but you know, if you want to save a little bit of space, um, just make sure that you uh, do bind that column in there so that uh, due to how Python works, you don't run into that bug. Okay, let's look at the memory usage now. Um, so I'm just gonna say memory usage and then sum, and now we're at like uh, 2.6 megs. Okay, so I think we were at three uh, prior to doing these type conversions, and I think we started off at four. So we're, we're about 60% of our memory here. Okay. Um, and uh, so most of that memory is from uh, text here. And uh, I'm just going to uh, do a, another uh, cool thing that pandas can do here. So he here's my memory usage here. I'm going to pipe this into this uh, function here. It's going to take the series. It's going to divide the series by the sum of the series times by 100. So uh, basically, that's going to give me the percent uh, of those values there. And you can see that you know 65% of our memory is taken up by that tweet text, right? So this is another little nice trick to have in your tool tip if you want to, you know know how much a column is consuming there. Um, so uh, really we are using quite a bit of uh, memory with our text there. Okay, so what can we do here? You can also see this permalink is taking up 26% of our memory. Um, if you look at the permalink, um, and again, you could look at it by doing something like this here, just comment, whoops, uh, comment this out. You can see the permalink is, is this. The first part of that uh, is the same. The only thing that changes is that ID at the end there. So 
you know, maybe we could go back and stick in the ID if we wanted to. Um, so um, let's let's try and do that. I'm going to say let's take my permalink and I'm going to convert it to just this categorical type. So Python pandas does have a categorical type. And so if you have low cardinality values, you could use that. Um, basically what it's gonna do is gonna store an integer into some buffer. So if you have 20 different values for the category, it's gonna store a value from zero to 20. So if you have a million, say I have car data, I've got a million rows of cars, but I only have 20 makes of cars. Instead of having 20, or, or instead of having a million unique strings and the overhead for that, I can say, well, I just have 20 strings and then I just have a number that points into one of those. So that's a categorical value there. Um, so by doing something like this, uh, we can now even lower our, I'm gonna keep the tweet ID, but I'm gonna just stick in the permalink there as a categorical. It's gonna take very little amount of data. And uh, you know, if I need to build up that link again, I can just take the ID and tack it on to the end of the permalink there. So we're, we're at about half the memory by doing that. Okay, um, questions, any questions here? What, uh, what approach would you take if you found yourself with more data than would fit in memory? Like this, this loads it into RAM and you're kind of whittling it down. What if, what if you were dealing something? Now, that's a great question. What, what would you do if you had too much data and that wouldn't fit into memory? So a couple things that you can do, Glenn. Um, when you load the data, you can tell it to only load certain columns. So it might be the case. So, so first of all, if your data at some point can't fit into pandas, um, it's going to be problematic, right? So, so you do have to have data that you're going to fit into pandas. So what I'm presuming is you've got like data that's a little bit too big, but eventually if you filter it and change the types, you figure that you would be able to fit it into pandas. Um, so that's kind of the first uh, checkbox. If, the, if, if that's not the case, then pandas you know, if, if it's too big for your machine, you need to get a bigger machine or you need to look at another solution. Um, but Pandas does have some tricks up its sleeve. Like you can say, I only want to load certain columns, right? And you can whittle down the columns and also specify the types when you're loading the data frame uh, with um, um, like read CSV, you can specify types in there if you want to. Um, so that's a little bit less powerful. But the other thing you can do with read CSV is you can batch it. You can say, I only want to load X number of rows at a time as well. So you can say, I, I want to load the first whatever, 10,000 rows, and then load the next 10,000 rows. So oftentimes, um, by doing some combination of filtering out columns and uh, only loading a certain number of, of rows, and then uh, compressing those rows and then loading the best amount, you can sort of uh, fit it into memory and build up your data frame uh, that way where that will work. Now, I'm not going to really get into it here, but at this point in time, uh, you know, Pandas is a small data tool, but it turns out that Pandas is also the lingua franca of, uh, of data manipulation in Python. So, uh, there are multiple big data tools that have adopted the Pandas API. What do I mean by that? Um, basically, like Spark, um, Dask, um, and, and there are others uh, that uh, basically replicate the Pandas API, but allow you to scale out. So those would be some other options as well. Does that help? Oh, yeah. Um, just as a follow-up, uh, do you think... Uh, because of the way it's organized in memory, would it be better to build it up? Like if, if you knew your data was um, going to largely be categorical, uh, would you work on it row, you know, chunking by rows? Or would it be better to, to build up your, your final data frame like column by column? Yeah, so generally when you're working in the analytics space, you want to use OLAP or columnar data stores, right? And, and so Pandas basically is columnar, right? It's an in-memory columnar data store and that everything is, is, op, uh, is stored as a column. Um, so the question, you know, if you've got categoric data, do you want to do that row by row, maybe to save memory? 
Um, I mean, you might consider batching it by a bunch of rows. I wouldn't do it row by row. That's going to be slow because basically eventually you're going to have to convert it back into a column. So working row by row that way is going to be slow. Um, generally, the take that I do, Glenn, is, is that maybe it's a little bit wasteful, but I, I load the raw data and then I start filtering that. Now I get that sometimes your raw data is too big. So in that case, you might need to sample the rows or sample or, you know, uh, chunk by rows and limit the columns. Another thing that I've done as well, Glenn, is I've sampled the data, right? If my machine wasn't quite big enough to hold all the data, then you can sample the data. Often even for like machine learning, uh, you can make uh, good enough models, not by using not all the data, but just a, a subset of it. Great questions. Other questions? Hey, I want to ask a question um, because I'm a really, really true novice of this thing. And, uh, uh, you know, I want to ask a very fundamental uh, question about pandas why we need to convert the row into columns in the pandas module what's the um what's the logic uh what or convenience that are you, are you talking about why why did i transpose it previously right 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 uh, yeah I, I want to go back to the very beginning because this is one of the questions that i want to uh, get answers from because um in the regular csv module then we don't transpose the rows to the columns and then we just uh, manipulate based on the columns that um the columns uh, that we um that were already in the CSV file. But it looks like, like Pandas is actually transpose the rows to the columns and, and, it, and it do stuff from there. So, so Pandas does have that capital T, which does a transposition. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes when you're doing numeric manipulation, transposing is useful. When I showed it up above, the reason I showed it is because oftentimes you can view a little bit more data by transposing it just due to how Jupyter and Pandas work in combination. Um, by uh, taking the index values, which are generally numeric and putting them into the columns, you compress that a little bit and it lets you see a little bit more of your data. So that was my purpose in showing transposition before, but also a pedag pedagogical excuse to talk about the column store and, and how Pandas optimizes your data. Okay, so the um, so there is no requirement to transpose the data, right? It's just an app option. No, there's no requirement to transpose. Pandas offers like 400 different things you can do. One of those is transposition, which comes in useful for some operations, but it's not required that you transpose data. I mean, when we say read CSV, we are reading the CSV file and it's giving us rows and columns from the CSV file. It's not, read CSV is not doing any transposition at that point. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so our next exercise here is uh, the alternate integer conversion exercise. So um, the first part, and, and, and this sort of builds up on each other. So first part, uh, use the select types method to filter out all integer columns from data frame, use the as type to convert all columns to uint eights, and then use assign with the above to create a new data frame with updated integer columns. So the point of this is to guide you along a path to show you an, another way that you can update your columns. So I'll let you work on this for a few minutes. If you have questions or need help, let me know. Happy to help you. But uh, hopefully this is enlightening because this is a cool technique that uh, most people don't know about. And I, I don't see anyone in the real world uh, talking about using techniques like this. So I'll let you try this out for a few minutes. Okay, um, let's look at this, this assignment here. So um, let's go in here, select D types to select all the int columns from DF. So I'm gonna say DF, and then I'm gonna do a chain here. So I put parentheses around that. I'm gonna say select D types and pull up the documentation for that. I, I think I've demoed that, but I'm gonna just say pull off all the integers here. So these are all the columns that are all integers. There are eight columns here, okay. And uh, then I'm going to uh, 
use as type to convert them to uint eights. So I'm going to say as type, and we're just going to say uh, as a string uint, not unit, uint eight. Okay. Um, you can see that that uh, seemed to work. Also, a truncated tweet ID. So probably wouldn't want to do this to tweet ID. So might want to filter this further out. But um, guess what we can do once we have that? Uh, once we have this, we can say, let's use a sign here. So what I can do is I can actually say DF, and then I'm going to say dot assign. And I'm going to assign this data frame here that I just made into my original data frame here, okay? And let's try and run that. And I get an error, it says assign takes one positional argument, but two will, were given. So instead of passing in a positional argument, what I'm gonna do is put a star in front of this. And uh, what that allows me to do is, remember we put a star in front of something in a call, if it's a mapping type object, it's gonna pull out uh, whatever the, keys are and point those to the values. It turns out that in pandas, when you do that with a data frame, it pulls out the column names. And so here we go. Um, this is a way if you've got a data frame and you want to update another data frame with it, uh, you just put a star in front of it and assign. So I'm using it here with integers here, but if I had another data frame and I wanted to update all the columns from the other data frame into this one, uh, just use a sign with a double star. Really, really powerful technique to do that. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Let's look at some of our other types here. Um, so we saw that we did uh, our, our integer types here. Um, I'm going to convert tweet text to a category and let's see what happens when we convert that to a category. And um, we get that the sum of the data is uh, 2.3 megs. So we're not, by converting tweet text to a category, we're actually using more data, more memory than, than we had. Remember up here when we did that, um, We were at 2.2 megs, and by converting that to a category, we're actually using more data. Why is that? Because if you think about my tweets, generally my tweets are not categorical, i.e. they don't repeat. I do have tweets that I repeat, but that's not very often. So we have what's called high cardinality. Um, so not a lot of repetition in those values. And so if you think about the abstraction that pandas is going to use to represent a categorical, it's basically going to say, you know, here's a little mask and we've got 20 different unique values of cars. And so we're going to have a value from zero to 20 in here. And it's going to point to another thing that holds the cars. And we only have 20 of those. However, we have, uh, if everything's unique, we're basically making a new mask. And then we're pointing that to basically the unique values which we are using before but we've got the overhead of the mask in there so there is some crossover point where uh, the cardinality of uh, the text makes it so using a categorical doesn't really make sense so it is possible if you have low cardinality by using a categorical you save a ton of memory and you also make operations faster but there is some crossover where it doesn't make sense and actually uses more memory and slows things down okay um, so I've got another assignment on that here. So this is our next assignment, which is use the double uh, double per, uh, uh, percent time it. So that's a, what's called a cell magic to see how long it takes to run stir.lower on the original permalink column and then create a new column, a new data frame DF2 with the current chain and use the time it cell magic to see how long it takes to run stir.lower on the new uh, tweet permalink column. So if you're not familiar with these cell magics, um, uh, these are things that are specific to Jupyter. I can say percent %ls magic, and this is a bunch of magics here um, that will list those. And so these are commands that you can do inside of Jupyter. And for example, one of those that it listed is time it. So if I wanna know what time it does, I can say percent percent time it and then put a question mark after it. And this says it times a Python statement or execution. 
Okay, so uh, what, what's going to happen here is if I want to do a micro benchmark in here, I can say percent percent time it, and then I can say how long does uh, two or three plus two take. And what it's going to do is it's going to run this some number of times. Uh, and once it gets a maximum amount of uh, time threshold, it will report on how many loops it did and how long it took. So this took 2.8 nanoseconds per loop. So this is a way for us to micro benchmark pretty easily from with inside of Jupiter. So what I want you to do is micro benchmark um, how long it takes to run stirred out lower on the original permalink column. And then I want you to do the same benchmark on uh, tweet permalink, which we have converted to a categorical and see what the difference there in that is. I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Again, if you need help or have questions, let me know. Okay, let's look at this assignment here. Hopefully you were able to try it out. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a time it, percent percent time it. I'm going to take the original data frame here. So that's just DF. And I'm going to say, um, let's take uh, the tweet permalink column. So I'm going to pull off tweet permalink. Um, tweet permalink. And I'm actually going to comment out this time here so I can make sure that I'm getting it right. Let's see, tweet permalink. Okay. And I got a spelling issue here. Okay, so there's the tweet permalink. And the option that I want to do is I want to do str lower. Okay, and so that looks like that worked. So I'm just gonna put the percent percent time it in there. That's gonna run that multiple times. Okay, and so that took three milliseconds to run. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a data frame with uh, my uh, data right here. And I'll just copy this uh, pipe here. And I'm gonna put this into it's data frame called data frame two. So I don't, I don't want to benchmark. I don't want the benchmark to include this part. So I'm, I'm going to do this outside of that. I'm going to say DF2 is equal to that. Okay. And then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say, because I don't want, you know, the conversion to be included in that benchmark time it. And then I'm going to say DF2. Now, because I have converted that into this, I should have a tweet. I should have tab completion on that. There we go. And I should be able to S say STR. I should be able to say dot lower and hit tab completion there. Okay, so that looks like that works as well. So again, in the first case, we're doing tweet permalink. Uh, we're, we're converting all those. Those are all Python strings. And so that takes three milliseconds to do it. In the second case, we have converted permalink into a categorical. There's basically only one of those. So uh, this is sort of showing you that you can get quite a speed up here. And this is saying it takes 900 microseconds to do this. And so it's about a third of the time. So uh, just a general note on benchmarking with pandas. Uh, make sure that your benchmark, you know, people will say, you know, you'll see people, myself included, say, you know, this is faster, this is slower. Um, you should sort of take those as a grain of salt. Always benchmark your operations on data that is the size of the data that you will be using in production. Oftentimes you'll see that in pandas, you know, depending on the size of data, certain things, certain operations might be quicker, or slower, or faster. So uh, it, it oftentimes is size dependent on your data. Okay, questions or concerns about this? Okay, cool. Okay, let's look at dates here. Um, we do have some date information. So um, here is uh, my uh, chain here and I'm just pulling off the time column. And if you look at that, you can see that it says it's a uh, date time 64. You can see the type here and it is in UTC time. 
Okay, um, that time, you can see that I'm not doing anything with date in here, but if we if you went to the original data, the original code that loaded this as a, from the CSV file, you can see that I did say parse dates in there. Um, right here, uh, you can see it said parse dates time. So, uh, So that's where that came from. Now, if I want to convert this to a different time zone, I can. Uh, I live in Salt Lake, and so this is all uh, mountain time zone, or to be pedantic, the America Denver time zone. So what I'm going to do in my assign is I'm going to say, let's take the time column and let's convert that to uh, the America Denver time zone. And when we run this, uh, when you look at this now, the type of it, it says that it's now in the American Denver time zone. So uh, that is how you do that. Because this is a time, it has a DT attribute. Because it has a DT attribute, there are various things you can do. One of those is convert the time zone there. Um, so that's uh, kind of nice. Uh, my recommendation for time is generally you should store your times as UTC. And then if you have time zone information, store that as a separate column. Um, one of the things I think is annoying about pandas is that if you have a column of times, uh, they can only be in a single time zone. You can't have a, well, you can have a column that has multiple time zones, but it doesn't use this type. It uses a different type that basically makes it so, what's the point of doing it? It, it changes the type there. So if, if you want to do uh, date manipulation, it's generally easiest to do that in UTC and then convert it uh, to local time as needed. Okay, um, so I'm gonna have, I have a little date exercise here for you. Create a series with the months of the time column. So uh, hopefully you have something like DF2 now and you should be able to take off time. So I want you to pull off the months of the time column. I'll give you a little hint. Uh, because it is a date, it has DT. And because it has that accessor, there are a bunch of things in there, hint, hint. OK, uh, the next part will be convert the time column to UTC. And then finally, convert the time column to America, uh, New York, to Eastern time. So I'll let you play around with that. Again, if you have questions or need help, let me know. But this is your chance to sort of dive into uh, the documentation using Jupyter and, uh, and this DT accessor. If, you, if you're familiar with the DT accessor and how to get the documentation, this uh, shouldn't be too much of a pull to do this assignment. Happy to answer any questions or concerns you might have as well. Okay, let's look at this assignment. I'm not seeing any questions here. Again, if you have questions, happy to answer them. Um, so the first part here, create a series with the months of the time column. So because this is a DT, one of the nice things we have is we have uh, the ability to say, pull off the month as a series. And we could do something like this where we'd say, if we wanted to stick this in as a month, we could say like df2 and then say dot assign and then say month is equal to df2 dot time dot dt dot month. And that would give us a new data frame that has that in the uh, um, as a month column here. Okay, so there is month right there. Uh, we also have a month name as well. So you can uh, look at month name, let's run that. And we get a value error. The issue is you need to call this, this is a method. So we're gonna call that there. And let's look at what the month name looks like. And you can see that that is the name if you want the name there. Cool. Uh, the next one, convert time to UTC. Okay, so let's, let's try that. I'm gonna say df2 dot time dot dt and uh, what do we have in here we have tz convert and tz localize so uh, i actually find these a little bit confusing um, so let's pull up localize here and it says localize to a tz aware date time and then um to create a time zone unaware, uh, pass tz is equal to none. So let's, let's try that. Uh, 
And you can see that that is uh, not UTC. Let's try UTC here. And we got an error here. It says already time zone aware, use TZ convert to convert. Okay, so it is already time zone localized. So this gives us the hint that uh, you're doing it the wrong way, use TZ convert. Um, so dt.tz convert, let's pull up the documentation for that. And um, a tz of none will convert to UTC. Okay, so we're gonna say tz is equal to none here and hopefully that works. And um, it says there is no time zone information there. Um, I'd actually prefer it to say UTC like that. So I'm going to say uh, time zone is equal to UTC. Yes, to be pedantic, UTC is not a time zone, but um, Pandas supports non time time zone um, in there. Okay, um, the next one: convert the time column to America, New York. Okay, so let's try that. Um, so America, New York is Eastern time zone. Uh, so there are a bunch of different ways of saying time zones like EST, EDT, that sort of thing to be pedantic, like EST is not a time zone, um, uh, but America, New York is the time zone. So a time zone is, is associated with a uh, location in there. So here is uh, America, New York, that looks like TZ convert worked. Uh, let's see if we can do that with TZ localize. And TZ localize and this doesn't work. So already aware, use TZ convert. Okay, so uh, presumably if you have something that is not um, time zone aware, then you could use this. Okay, uh, any questions or concerns about this? What, what would the use for localize be? Like if it were strings still? Yeah, so let's convert this to a string. Um, so here's the string version here. And then we're gonna do, um, PD dot two date time. Okay, and this uh, put it as UTC. So um, let's see. Yeah, so um, let's strip off the last. Uh, uh, so I'm going to say str.slice, and what is it, one, yeah, the last six characters. So we're going to go from minus six to the end. Um, let's see if this works. Minus six to the end. Nope, I want to go from zero to minus six. Okay, so, and then we're gonna do PD.2 date time. This should give us a non-UTC time. And then on this, we should be able to uh, localize that. Uh, okay, and we got ambiguous time zone here. Okay, so because I, I pulled off that offset, then I, I have an ambiguous time zone. So um, we need to say like ambiguous. So this this time zone here, 120 can, like this is the, the data. That I, I posted a tweet at a time when um, uh, it's ambiguous here. So uh, ambiguous. We can say true. Let's see if this works. Okay. So uh, 
if you have a time that is not, that is just, uh, I'll call it wall clock, right? But it's not, it doesn't have a time zone associated with it, then localize uh, should be able to do that. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, totally. That was awesome. Okay. Yeah, time, time, yeah. You'd have a talk all about time zones and time zone fun, but um, it wouldn't be very much fun. Okay, so the next next section here um, is chaining. And uh, I've sort of been doing this all along. Hopefully you've seen how I've sort of built up these chains. And uh, I'm a huge fan of chaining. If you uh, look at my books, like, um, like this book here, Panda's uh, cookbook, I uh, wrote the second edition of this. I didn't write the first edition of this, but um, basically rewrote all of the code in that with a chaining style. My, my book that I just released, Effective Pandas, uh, it, it, uh, it sort of dives into chaining uh, with a lot of real world examples similar to this uh, tutorial here. Um, I'm very uh, heavy endorser of chaining. You can see that I, I sort of start off with something simple and then I build it up as I'm going along. It gives me a bunch of benefits along the way. It lets me work with the raw data. I do encourage people to work with the raw data rather than working with intermediate data. It might be a little bit slower, but you do have the ability to go back and trace where your data is coming from. Variably, I found that my boss or client always wants me to explain something. And if I don't work with the raw data, it makes it really hard to do that. Also, if you do chaining, it makes it really easy to look at your code and it reads like a step. So by putting these constraints of forcing you to use chaining, and you don't have to use chaining, but if, if, you, if you adopt that strategy, it's gonna force you to write code that looks like one step at a time. So your code will look like a recipe. It's also easy to debug. You can see how I've been debugging this along the way. So um, I, I don't really see many reasons not to use chaining. The other nice thing about using chaining is that rather than having a bunch of cells with a bunch of intermediate objects, you just have one clean step. So it makes it really easy to come back to your notebook, your analysis later on, and just start going where you come from. I've seen uh, multiple times where people have notebooks where they have a bunch of operations that they might do in arbitrary order, and it makes it really confusing to come back to. Can't remember which cells you ran and which order that you executed them in. So chaining helps alleviate that as well. Um, yeah, I've got the hint here. If you find some operation that you can't do a chaining, consider using pipe. And uh, I've, I've shown that. So what I like to do after I've made this chain here is I'll just convert it into a function. That's another thing that a lot of people who are doing data don't do is they don't use functions here, which uh, for most software development is like a big no-no doing things at the global level. So uh, by putting that into a function, I can now uh, start sharing this, I can test it, I can deploy it, that sort of thing. So here is my function to uh, uh, manipulate my Twitter data and I can just go through it. The first thing I'm gonna do is rename my columns. The next thing I'm gonna do is gonna drop the promoted columns. Next thing I'm gonna do is drop these other columns as well with these names. Then I'm going to convert impressions to a UN32. I'm gonna convert engagements to a UN16. I'm gonna convert replies, hashtag clicks and follows to a UN8. I'm gonna convert all of these to UN16. I'm going to uh, make a column called tweet permalink by converting this thing into a categorical. And I'm going to update my time column and put it in the America Denver time zone. So it reads as a step of each of these things or a step that I'm doing to this. I can go through and comment this out if I want to, but uh, pretty clean. Okay, and then if I had a notebook, um, I would basically at the first cell of my notebook, do my imports, load my raw data, and then on my next uh, uh, line here, or in my next cell, I would have this. I run those two cells and I'm good to go. Um, everything just works. Now contrast this, this is the sort of date, this is the sort of um, code that I see in the real world where people will do something like this, okay? And if you run this, um, you get, you know, it looks like it works, but you get all these warnings all over the place. So this is the dreaded uh, setting with copy warning. 
that um, if you use pandas and you program pandas in the style that looks like this up here, you'll see all over the place. And then you'll like go to Stack Overflow and try to figure out what this means. And it'll be really confusing because no one really knows what it means or understands what, what it's causing it. But basically the solution is to stick a copy. And so people will basically come up here and they'll put copies on all this. So the, their whole complaint against not using this chains is because chaining is making a copy, but then they run into these issues. And then in order to get around them, they put in all these copies all over the place to get around the issue that they complain about anyway. So uh, their code is messier. I think this is harder to read. Um, it's not clear what's important here. Like there's a bunch of intermediate variables. I don't care about the intermediate variables. I care about the cleaned up data. And so um, as you can tell, uh, not a fan of this style of code. It makes it hard to read, hard to debug, hard to share. It's making global variables, makes it hard to test, hard to put in production. Um, basically, if you adopt chaining, you're going to be uh, a lot more productive and you're going to be a lot happier with how you, how you uh, manipulate your code. Okay, for those who are questioning, like, how do I debug this? Um, let me just give you some examples of debugging it. Uh, you know, if you do want an intermediate variable, we can leverage pipe to do that. So I made a little uh, function called get variable, and it's just going to use Python globals and inject a variable into the global namespace. So look at this. I'm just going to say, let's call get variables, and the name of the variable is going to be renamed df. And then it's going to call this, going to pass in my current state of my data frame with the variable name, make a variable with that, and then return this. So I can keep going along here. Um, I can also comment this out. And you saw me do that previously. I can comment out the pipe and sort of walk through it. Um, I can also pipe to display. So you can see down here, I've got a little pipe here. I'm piping to the IPython display function. So I'm using Lambda to do that. You could have a non-Lambda function do that as well. OK, let's run this. And uh, what you see in the output here this first output is actually not the output of the cell. This is the output of this code up here to print this out. So this is this display right here. So this is the one after I dropped uh, email tweet, app installs, app opens, et cetera. Um, but I have not converted the types yet. So you could look at this if you want to. And that's this uh, one that printed up, up here. Um, and uh, there's no output on this other than that, because I have a variable assignment here. But I also have a variable called rename df. So this rename df is the intermediate state right up here, right after that. So if I need to get the intermediate state, I can. Um, again, generally, I don't need to do that. Or I, I'm debugging this as I'm building it up along the way. But uh, it, you know, if you need to debug that or look at those, you certainly can. OK, so this is just uh, cleaning this back up, removing those debug statements. OK, so I've got a, a little exercise here. I think this is a, a fun one. This is kind of nice. Um, uh, use pipe to print the shape of the data frame after every step of the chain in the tweet Twitter function above. So th this is something that, you know, especially if you start merging uh, data frames with other ones, it's nice to see uh, what the size of those are after every step. So um, your challenge for this exercise is just to stick in a pipe here with a little function after each of these steps here that will tell us what the shape of the data frame is. So I'll let you work on that for a few minutes. Again, if you need help or have questions, let me know. OK, let's look at this chain exercise here. Uh, Glenn using a pipe to debug long chains is gold. Awesome. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I'm, I'm just going to copy this cell up here just by hitting C and then hitting V down here to paste this. And then I'm going to make a little function here called uh, shape, or I'll call it get shape. Okay. So because I'm going to leverage pipe, it needs to take the data frame as the first argument here. And if you want, you can have some other things. You can say like a name is equal to, and I'll just set that equal to an empty string. And then we're going to say print uh, name. And we're going to say df.shape. And then we're just going to return uh, df here. Okay. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, let's pipe. 
git shape. And uh, it's a, we're throwing that function in there. So we don't call the function. And then I can say like name is equal to, maybe we can say this step one, right? So this is where we start off with. And um, instead of making uh, twit df be that, I'm just going to look at the output here. So step one, we have 500 or 5,791 rows and uh, 40 columns. Okay, so then I can just take this and start going crazy with my copying and pasting. After step two, we have that. After step three, we have this. After step four, we have this. And a sign is kind of one step. So I'm gonna just put this after step five here. Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader if you want to like be able to go in and debug after each new column creation, what the shape is there. Okay, so you can run that and you see, there we go. After each of these steps, um, we have not filtered any of the rows, but we have uh, indeed removed columns along the way. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, this comes in super useful if uh, you're merging uh, data, especially if you have like some cross join or something like that, and you have a combinatorial explosion, you might want to be aware of what's going on there. Any questions or concerns before we cruise along? Okay. Um, Okay, next section here, don't mutate. So I've, I've sort of made this point along the way. Um, so I'm linking to a issue in the Pandas uh, project uh, from core developer, Jeff Reback. If you are, you're missing the point, in place rarely does something in place. Uh, you think you are saving memory, but you are not. So if you look at you know something like drop, um, you can pull up the documentation. You can see that there is an in place option here, okay? And so uh, a lot of things have in place, but when you do in place, what it does is generally it takes your result, makes a copy or goes out and does the result, which oftentimes includes making a copy, and then it pushes that back in after it. So you're not really saving memory by doing in place, but what is happening by doing in place is that you can't do chaining because when you do in place, it doesn't return the new result there. So in general, you don't get any performance benefits nor memory improvements by doing in place, though people tend to think that there are. Uh, you can't chain with it. So that's annoying because I think chaining is, is something that everyone should adopt. Um, and you'll start seeing all these sitting with warning uh, errors that um, are annoying. So. Don't mutate. Um, again, the bug here, is, the issue that I've linked to is an issue in the pandas uh, uh, code base to actually remove in place. There's a, a, an open ticket to remove it because the developers feel that it, it shouldn't have been added and it was a mistake to be in there. So I don't have an assignment for this or an exercise, just this is a note. Uh, you'll see a lot of people say, just use in place. And my comment is uh, you shouldn't use it and it, it, it might not be in future versions of Pandas. Okay, uh, the next section is about application. It turns out that, uh, so let me just load my data here. I'm gonna just run the cell. So that I now have this twit df, which is uh, my cleaned up little uh, data here. Um, now, uh, let's say I wanted to uh, convert engagement rate to a percent. I could do apply, because they plot the engagement rate, apply this 2% function here. So the percent function takes a value and multiplies it by 100. And that looks like it works. You know, I'm getting 1.9% uh, on my second tweet there. Uh, now, it turns out that pandas, due to how it works and being built on top of NumPy, can do this in a much more optimized way. We can say, uh, just take that column and multiply it by 100. And if you look at that, that looks like it gives you the same result. However, uh, how this is being calculated is not the same. Uh, because this is using a Python function, we're using apply, Python is going to pull out each cell, uh, convert it into a Python number, and then throw that into the uh, percent 
function and then push it back in versus this one down here, engagement rate star 100 is gonna say here is a buffer, right? Remember we said NumPy leverages C buffers under the covers there. Here's a buffer, multiply it by 100 and put in the new value there. So it does it all in one step and it's fast. So in fact, we can do a little micro benchmark on this and we can see uh, that it's it's around 15 times, depending on the time of day when I run this. So uh, my slow version takes 3.7 mi microseconds. Uh, my fast version uh, takes 274 uh, microseconds. So milliseconds versus microseconds. Uh, so uh, pretty good speed up. Now, um, what about uh, streams? So I might wanna say, uh, you know, uh, do some string operation. And one of the things I've heard uh, as I've looked into tweeting and making effective tweets is that if you use Unicode, your tweets will be more effective. So I might want to, to do some analysis and see if my tweets were actually Unicode. Um, did that make a change here? So how, how do I tell if my tweet is Unicode? Well, one of the things we can do is we can encode it into ASCII and then we can decode it from ASCII. And so let's run that. And so here I've got, uh, you know, some just a Python stream that I, uh, hello is, is a smiley face. Um, and, uh, if, you know, if I decode, encode that to UTF-8 and then decode it, I get the smiley face there. If I encode it to ASCII, but say, uh, just replace it with question mark instead of throwing an error, I get uh, that. So uh, uh, maybe a poor man's way of determining whether something has Unicode in it is convert it into ASCII and back. And if it's the same as it was before, then it doesn't have Unicode, right? Ask if it's just purely ASCII, it doesn't have Unicode. So I might make a function like that, is Unicode uh, converted to ASCII, and then convert it back. And if it's not equal to that original value, then it is Unicode. So let's let's do that here. And I already talked about LS magic that just lists the magic. I already talked about time it here. So I'm gonna uh, uh, apply is Unicode versus doing this operation here. Instead of doing apply, I'm going to take my column and do a stir and code and then a stir decode and check if that's equal to the original value. Okay, and you can see that in this case, when I do apply, um, it's actually faster than doing that this with uh, the Python or the Pandas version. Again, uh, when you are using string manipulation in Pandas, unless you're using categoricals, you're in Python land, you're in slow land, you're going down the slow path. So in that case, apply uh, might make sense. But if you're doing numeric operations, you don't want to use apply because then you're taking a fast operation and putting it back into um, you know, Python land. Uh, similarly, I can say like, uh, is it a return? It does it start with an at? And then uh, you can see how long that takes versus um, doing just str.starts with. In this case, there's not much of a difference between those. So uh, I say don't use apply. Uh, that should have a little star. I'm, I'm actually okay with apply if you're using string manipulation. It turns out that apply, if you're using apply with NumPy functions, it goes down the fast path because it realizes that this is a NumPy function and can apply it to the whole column there. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna update my tweak Twitter here. I'm just gonna add a couple new features to this. Like, um, is it a reply? What's the length of it? The number of words is Unicode, et cetera. So a lot of these are stream manipulations here, but I'm gonna make a new uh, twit DF object here after doing that. Okay, so this is uh, my new data set. I've, I've cleaned it up a little bit. So we've got um, a apply exercise here and um, I think due to the sake of time, I'm gonna skip apply because I wanna be able to cover um, the material. And if we have enough time, maybe we'll come back to it. Um, but let me ask if there are any questions before we proceed here. Okay, so again, takeaway here, apply is generally slow for numeric operations for strings, it's okay. Um, the caveat with numeric operations, if you apply with a NumPy function, NumPy's are vectorized and so that those go down the fast path. Okay, so this is a, a, a really cool section, mastering aggregation. So once you've got your data sort of cleaned up like we've done here, then you can start doing the interesting parts, um, which is, you know, when people ask you like, 
you know, what time of day do people respond at or which year had the most tweets, that sort of thing, we can, we can do that. And, and we do this with grouping operations. So when, when someone asks you, uh, you know, what type or when, or, you know, to do some sort of comparison, your mind should start thinking, I, I need to like group or pivot this data. And Pandas has a way to do this. So uh, this first part, um, what is the code here is basically saying, um, what's the mean value for each year for my numeric values for tweets here. So um, let's just sort of comment out what's going on here. Here's my data and I'm gonna group it by this uh, twitdfdt.year. So I'm gonna pull out the year and I'm gonna group it by that. Now in pandas, when you group, grouping is lazy. It doesn't do anything until you tell it you want to aggregate. So what am I gonna aggregate? I'm gonna say, let's do a mean. So this is gonna take every year entry, all the numeric values for all the year entries and give us the mean value of this. Let's look at the result of this. You can see in the index here, uh, we have um, the year, right? So 2020 and 2021. And then each column is the numeric columns and these are the mean values. So you can see like impressions, my mean impression was a thousand. Uh, in 2020, my mean impression was um, 3,000 in 2021. Um, my mean engagement was 55 and 155. So uh, turns out that in 2021, I started taking Twitter seriously. And, and so um, you can see that uh, there's a change in uh, these numbers here by doing that. Okay, now I could also write this as one line like this here, but I do like writing it as a chain. And I, I think this line here is a little bit, you know, it's, it's the same code, but it's just getting a little bit long, so it's hard to read. So by simply putting parentheses on it and formatting it, it's gonna make it easier to read and understand. And you, you do want your code to be easy to read and understand here. Okay, let's do this next one here. I'm gonna group by, so again, group by is lazy, and then I'm gonna pull off impressions. And this is still lazy because it hasn't done an aggregation. So after I pull off impressions, we're gonna take the mean. So this is just giving me a series with the mean of the impressions for each year, right? Um, now, this next thing, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do uh, some timing here. Note that uh, we can calculate the aggregation and then pull off the columns, or we can pull off the columns and then calculate the aggregation. So depending on what you wanna do, uh, oftentimes you want to limit the amount of work and by pulling off the columns first, um, you can see that we takes almost a third of the time, it takes 15 milliseconds versus 40 milliseconds to do that. The same result, but this one up here is taking the mean of all the numeric columns. This one down here is only taking the mean of the impressions and the replies. Okay. Um, so we, we've talked about if you have a stir that you can, if you have an object column, you can do stir on it and you can do very string operations here. So these are all uh, bonus things that you get by having strings in there. So if, if you wanna pull something off of that tweet, you can. Um, we, we can also, um, we can pull off the year and we can rename the year if we want to. So, you know, here's DT. When you look at the time of that, the time of that, or the name of that says time, uh, you can rename that if you want to. Um, we can change uh, the format here. If you look at the float format, um, it's, it is none right now. So if, if you want to, you can change that. Um, so here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's group by, and I'm going to pull off the year, and I'm gonna rename it as year. And then I'm gonna group by month and rename it as month. Um, and then we're gonna look at impressions and replies, take the mean of that, and then I'm gonna style that. So um, let, me, let me just sort of uh, comment this out and let's walk through this. Okay, so here's our group by, and um, you know it doesn't do anything until we take the mean. Okay, so there is impressions and replies, and you can see that because we grouped by a year and month, um, 
in the index here, we have what's called a hierarchical or multi-index. So year in the outer and then month in that. So that's kind of cool. Uh, we can break it down by hierarchies there. I'm gonna do a round here, which should uh, just show the first uh, two decimal points. And then um, we can also change the style of that if we want to. I can say for replies, I wanna show uh, th three digits of precision. And for impressions, I want to show it in uh, exponential notation there. You can do that as well to just uh, take that. Now, uh, depending on which version of pandas you have, um, you might, uh, let's uh, just change that here. And I'm gonna put, if I don't rename that, uh, you get something that looks like this. So this just says time and time here instead of month and year. Uh, because both of these were derived from the time column. So I, I am doing that rename there just to make that a little bit more friendly to read. Any questions about that? So it's sort of showing how to build these up um, step by step. Okay. Um, so let's let's do some more examples here. Um, I'm going to do a group by year and month. I'm going to pull off impressions and replies. And instead of doing mean, I'm going to do median. Okay. So here is the median value, and I think median is probably better in this case because uh, this is th this data isn't normal, and so uh, median's a better central tendency location than uh, the skewed mean data. But one of the nice things about this is now I can plot this in pants. I can just tack on a plot there, and this is gonna plot each column against the index here. So watch what happens here. Uh, we get here are our median impressions, and here are our median replies. And if I wanna change that from median to mean, I can do that. If I want to, you know, look at the standard deviation instead, I can say STD. I can put whatever grouping I want in here and uh, see what's going on. So uh, once you master these, it's really easy to change them, try different things out, and visualize them. Now, one of the things that might be annoying about this is if you look at um, the index, the x-axis here, it's a tuple, which is kind of weird. So I probably don't want that. Um, so how do we get rid of that? Well, it turns out that pandas has an alternate syntax. Instead of grouping by this list here, we can say we want to group by this PD grouper thing, which is a little bit confusing, but basically we're gonna pass in the column and this thing called an offset alias here. So I'm gonna say, I wanna group this on the time column at a two month frequency. And watch what happens here. I'm gonna not do the plot first of all. So this is what we get in the index. We don't have a multi-index or hierarchical index, but if you look at the dates here, this is January, March, uh, May, et cetera. So every two months, if I just change this like that, this is every month. If I want it every four months, I can say four in here. So this is pretty cool here, uh, the ability to do that. And then I can just stick on a plot now. Now, because this is a date um, instead of a tuple, we get uh, the nice X axis right here. We can change that from median to mean or whatever. And uh, there's our above plot here, but with a nice X axis here. Okay, one of the nice things about this grouper is that I can do things like I wanna do every two weeks. So you can do every two weeks or every three weeks. And uh, you know all you have to do is change that to get the different frequency. You can even do things like this. I can do, I want to do seven days and five hours. So this is, um, you know, seven days and five hours later, this is the aggregation, seven days and five hours later, this is the aggregation, right? And then you can stick on a plot on that if you want to. And this is the seven day, five hour aggregation. Now, is there anything sp special about seven days and five hour? No, just wanted to demonstrate that like uh, this offset alias is pretty powerful and that uh, you can, you know, this is, this whole thing is basically one line of code. I've written it out as multiple lines of code, but you can do a lot of powerful things with pandas once you start understanding these grouping operations here. Okay, so here I'm gonna, uh, remember I said, I heard that Unicode makes a difference. So I'm gonna actually explore that a little bit. I'm gonna say, let's group by every seven days and five hours, which is sort of silly, but also whether it's Unicode or not. Okay, and so when I do that, I get this hierarchical index here. Uh, here's their time, seven days and five hours later. And, but we also have, is Unicode or not? Okay, and then, and if I want to, I can plot that. 
and I get that weird index there, that's not uh, particularly useful. I really want to compare uh, the Unicode plots versus the non-Unicode plots. So how can I do that? Um, um, I'm going to I'm going to show an example uh, a little bit later how I do that. Um, before I do that, let me just show you some other things I can do. I can also group by multiple aggregates. So here uh, up above, I was just grouping by mean. Well, let's do mean, median, and this uh, one that I defined here, the second to last value. And so you can do that. And look at this: we have hierarchical index and we have hierarchical columns here. So pretty powerful. I mean, again, one line of code, but you can sort of slice and dice this however you want. Um, so it, you know, you can say, let's plot this. This is not a particularly nice plot because it's taking every column and plotting it and it's plotting them against uh, uh, this tuple here, which is kind of weird. So I, I probably wouldn't give that plot to my boss, but um, again, it's pretty easy to plot those. Now, let me show you what I'd like to do once I have something like this here. Um, I can do this unstack. So note here, I've got time and is Unicode in my index here. I'm gonna unstack this. This is gonna pull out is Unicode. And so unstack basically pulls something out of the index and puts it into the columns. So now my columns have three levels here, but you can see that I have uh, for each impression, here's the mean value and here's the true and false value for whether it's Unicode or not. So this is pretty powerful, also a little bit confusing, but uh, you can see how you can start slicing and dicing this. So what I'm gonna do here is, let me just uh, show you uh, what we have here. Uh, so here's our aggregation, mean, uh, median, and second to last. I'm gonna unstack that, that will pull out is Unicode here, and then I'm gonna pull out impressions from that. So these are the, uh, uh, for mean, median, and second to last, and is Unicode, these are the values there. Uh, pretty cool, uh, the ability to do that. And so um, if I just want the mean here, I can pull off mean from that. So that's what this next one is doing. Um, so here, here's uh, just the mean values. We're, we're here, here's what we had before, and here's the mean value for that. Now I have a note here, you have to use the index style here rather than the column name. That's because Panda's data frame has a method called mean. So in order to make sure that I'm using the column, I need to put that as the index uh, notation there. Okay, at this point, I have a data frame that's pretty flat, right? It's, it's, it doesn't have hierarchical index or hierarchical columns. So I could tack on a plot to that if I wanted to. Um, here's just an example of, of pulling off the mean, trying to do that instead of getting the column, I get the bound method. So just note that if you have a column that co uh, collides with a, a name of an attribute, you might have to use that uh, index access. Okay, so here's our plot of that. And this is looking at whether something is Unicode or not and looking at the mean values of that over time. So from, from looking at this, it looks like you know impressions, certainly uh, my Unicode impressions are higher than my non-Unicode impressions. And if I wanna change this, instead of every seven days, I can change it to two weeks, or I can change it to every four weeks, which is a month, right? Or I can change it to every quarter, which is Q. And it looks like, um, you know, but by most of these measures here, whatever I'm doing, um, Unicode gets more views than non-Unicode. Okay, if I want to um, uh, slice it a little bit more, I can use loc to, pull, to drill into that. So if I wanna look at like uh, July to August here, what's going on uh, in this peak part here, I can uh, use loc to pull that out. So here is, um, the interesting part, you can see that I, I have like I, I have a missing value uh, for one of these dates. I didn't tweet anything with Unicode in there, um, but I can also you know stick on a plot there. Um, that's what that looks like. Uh, I can uh, fill in missing values. So because these are missing values, I got various options. I can say, well, let's put in a zero for that missing value, so I don't have a hole. That's a zero for it. I can say, let's interpolate that. Um, that's gonna just connect the dots here. So it does a linear interpolation. So again, here's no interpolation and it's just gonna draw the line here from there to there to interpolate that. Um, let's do a backfill. So backfill is gonna take this uh, value and push it back this way. You should see a plateau there going across. You can also do a forward fill instead if you wanna push a forward fill value forward. Um, 
again, sometimes this is easier to view on the on the just data here. You can see that we're pushing this 5,000 value forward with a backfill. We're going to pull the 6,000 value back. Um, you can also say drop NA as well. So in that case, it, we, we just uh, drop that value and uh, that's what the plot looks like. Uh, note that in this case, you're also dropping the other columns. So probably don't want to do the drop NA value, but those are various ways that we can handle the missing, missing data in there. Okay, in this, in this case, um, I'm going to interpolate the missing values. And you know, if, if we do that, uh, we get something that looks like this. So this is uh, every three days, this is what it looks like. Now this is a little jagged. And so a technique that a lot of people do is in, uh, they just do a rolling average. So I'm gonna do a, a, a seven rolling average. So since this is three days, this is gonna be a 21 day rolling average here. Um, so if I do that, um, when I do rolling, it's lazy. This is like another aggregation, but instead of doing grouping, I'm going to take a sliding window of seven. So I need to apply an aggregation to that. And the aggregation I'm going to do is mean. You can see that the first seven entries here are missing because they don't have, or the first six entries will be missing because they don't have those. But when we plot that now, this smooths it out. So this is another really cool technique just by putting in these two lines. I can take this uh, data here that's a little bit jagged and I can smooth it out and put a rolling average on it very easily there. And if I didn't want the rolling mean, if I want the rolling median or the rolling max, um, we can just change this from you know, mean to max. And here's the rolling max, right? So pretty cool, pretty cool. Once you start mastering these, you can build up these chains and do some really powerful stuff here. Okay, in addition, you can uh, do what are called named aggregations. This helps get rid of the, those columns that were hierarchical. I'm gonna say, uh, let's aggregate. I wanna make a new column called total views, which is taking the oppression columns and taking the sum of that. I take mean views, which is taking the oppression columns and making the mean of that. Make profile clicks, which is taking profile clicks and just giving the sum of that. You, this is just showing that I can throw in any uh, function that I want to that does a collapse or a reduction or an aggregation. And so you can see that I don't have hierarchical columns here. I just have um, flat columns in this case. So this uh, is a powerful feature to eliminate those uh, hierarchical columns. Okay, so uh, just a caveat here, you see that I am grouping with PD grouper here. Uh, Pandas also has this thing called resample. If I set the index to a date time, you can do resample. However, in this case, um, resample fails here, um, which is kind of weird. It turns out that resample doesn't have access to uh, these named aggregates, um, which I think is a bug or annoying. Um, it should, but if you do group by instead of resample, it does work. Okay, and so uh, <clears throat> here is another plot. This is, um, well, we can just debug this, right? If I, I'm like, what's going on here? What is this? Um, this is grouping by month and is Unicode. And we're looking at uh, the total views, the mean views and the profile clicks. If we unstack this, it's gonna pull off the Unicode in there. And if we wanna look at profile clicks, and so this is looking at profile clicks versus Unicode. So do, um, you know, including Unicode in my tweet cause people to uh, click on the profile. And so let's look and see if that is the case. And it looks like that is indeed the case, right? So, uh, you know, a, a hint for people looking to in increase uh, interaction with your tweets is to apparently use Unicode in your tweets. Okay. Um, we got a few minutes to do this aggregation exercise. So I, I, I would like to do this since we've got like 15 minutes left. But before I do that, I wanna ask what questions or concerns you might have. Hopefully this is sort of some really nice meat for you, uh, super powerful stuff that you can use and leverage. I think we're good. Okay. I'll, I'll let you work on this for a few minutes. Uh, try your hand at aggregation. I think uh, 
if you uh, play with this uh, assignment, you're going to um, hopefully open your eyes to some of the powerful things you can do with pandas. Okay, let's let's look at this aggregation exercise here. Hopefully you're able to play around with it for a little bit. Um, the first one, what are the total impressions for each year? So this is kind of like math in like junior high or whatnot, where you have to convert a word problem into code rather than convert it into math problem, we're gonna convert it into code. So let me give you a hint here. When you see something like for each year or by each year, that tells you that you want to aggregate by year. So we're gonna, I'm gonna start off with twit here, um, not tweet Twitter, uh, twit df. And then I'm gonna say group by, group by, and I'm gonna group by the year. Now, I don't, I don't have a year column, I have this time, col time column. So I've got two options to do that. I can use PD grouper, or I can use, um, I can pull off from the time the year. So maybe I'll just show both of those for you. Um, so if I want year, I can say from time dt.year. Uh, really nice, once you convert things to dates, you can pull off uh, those parts of it pretty easily. And I want impressions. And then I want the total for each year. So I'm just gonna say sum. So again, aggregation function that takes a lot of values and collapses them to a single value. Look at that, uh, there we go. We can see that um, you know in 2000, I had 2 million impressions. Um, and in uh, uh, 2021, I have 10 million impressions. And, and so leveraging some of these Twitter techniques, I'm now, you know, some months I get two, 2 million impressions in a month. So um, and for me, this is showing me that, you know, if you want to improve something, you can track some metrics, but also like looking at your metrics using tools like Pandas. Uh, I think using tools like Pandas was uh, really powerful for me to let me do better tweeting. Um, so I mentioned I'd say how to do this the other way, which would be using grouper. So this is PD grouper. This is one the, uh, I, not, I think the documentation for this is a little bit weird, like star args and star star KW args. But basically we're gonna give it a key, which is the column and the freak here, which is this offset alias. And I wish the offset alias uh, was actually shown in here, but this is, there's a link here to show you these offset aliases. So let me just uh, very quickly show you those. So these are offset aliases. There is also, I also list them in my book here, Effective Pandas, but um, you know, if you want uh, the business day, you put C. If you want the calendar day, you put D. If you want the weekly frequency, you put that. Um, so uh, those are the offset aliases. And it turns off you can shift these and you can also like do like five weeks, right? But you can like shift, you can have a week that's ending on Sunday versus a week that's ending on Tuesday. Um, so, um, so PD grouper, and I, I, I'm going to say, uh, the key is equal to time and the freak is equal to, uh, Y freak equals Y. Okay. And I got a syntax error. Um, which is the bane of existence everywhere. Uh, line six, it says, is a syntax error. And the issue is I need an extra parenthesis here. Okay, so uh, pretty similar. The issue is here, uh, if you contrast this, this one actually has a date in the index. This one here actually has an integer in the index. Okay, um, let me just show you that other thing. I could say like freak and I can say like, I want week. So here's every week. And if I want to end this on Tuesday, I can say week dash two. And you can see that this ends on uh, January 7th. If I change this to Monday, uh, it, it changes the date. So pretty powerful. If I want to change it on Sunday, uh, you can change when those aggregations uh, and if I want to do every four weeks ending on Sundays, right, you can do that. So pretty, pretty cool stuff that you can do here uh, with pandas. Okay, um, so the next one is what were the total impressions uh, for each month? 
So uh, really easy to get that from year, just change that uh, Y to an M. Okay, so this is a little bit different than this one up here. Um, note that if I do this one up here, If I do this one and I say group by, and I say vt.month, I'm grouping by an integer and the integer doesn't have the year information with it. So this is just gonna be for every month. That might be interesting to you, but you probably want to do uh, this one instead, which is gonna be the month for every year. Okay, and the, again, uh, really easy to visualize this. We just tack on a plot to, to see what's going on uh, to those impressions. Okay, and that was the next one, plot the previous. So we just tack on a plot to that to get that. Okay, and the next one here, um, what were the total impressions for Unicode and non-Unicode tweets for each month? Um, let me copy and paste this, and uh, hopefully I can get this done before we run out of time here. So I'm gonna group by this, and I'm gonna group by also the is Unicode column, and um, we're gonna plot impressions and sum that, there we go. Uh, that's what that looks like. And now I want to pull out is Unicode. So to do that, I unstack that. There we go. And, and that, that is the impressions for Unicode versus non-Unicode here. And the next one is plot that. So we just tack on a plot to that. There we go. Uh, Unicode impressions versus non-Unicode impressions. I mean, this is one line of code, but I've written it out as multiple lines of code here. Um, next one here, uh, total impressions for reply and non-reply treats for each month. Okay, so uh, this one, um, I'll do, I'm, all I'm gonna do is just, I'm just gonna tack on an is reply instead of is Unicode here. Okay, so uh, generally people don't see your replies, which makes sense. Um, uh, you know, because that's aimed at a certain person. So unless they're following that person, they won't see the reply. Okay, um, so that is aggregations. Hopefully you are able to mess around with these and try these out. Uh, super powerful. Uh, again, the syntax might be a little bit confusing, but once you start messing around with these, they're gonna open doors and make it really easy to do uh, some cool operations. Okay, so uh, we're kind of at the end here. So in summary, if you use the correct types, you're gonna save space. You'll, you'll probably uh, use less memory and you can in, uh, improve the performance there. Um, huge fan of chaining. I don't think I'm gonna go over it much more. If you haven't tried it, try it and see how you like it. I find that it's sort of like white space when people come to Python, they're like, I hate this white space once they tried it they don't go, it's, it's not a big deal. I think similar with chaining. Once you try it, you're gonna see that there are a lot of benefits and very little downside to it. Uh, don't mutate, uh, apply is slow for math operations. And then these aggregations are super powerful. Um, uh, uh, use them. I'm gonna put a link uh, to my book here, Effective Pandas, 20% uh, off if you're interested in that. If you wanna connect with me on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, happy to do that. Um, I'll put that link here in uh, the chat, in the Slack, and also in, in the chat here. Um, uh, been a pleasure being with you. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about pandas. We have a couple minutes left. If there are any questions or whatnot, uh, happy to address those. This was great, Matt. Um, I will say, uh, in particular, at least to me, the, the use of pipe to debug a long chain um, is, is great because uh, stylistically notebooks in, in, in my experience I tend to inherit other people's notebooks and they are just a mess <clears throat> and then when you when you run into some kind of question with something that is chained uh, you know normally my first mo uh, would be to, to break it up and then that's even more intermediate variables which, which just furthers the mess so I, I think your your style here and these tips are, are just awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I I found that a lot of people are like, oh, this, this is long code, it's hard, right? But I think the constraints of step-by-step -step is actually going to force you to think about what's going on and write it in a better way. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I think it's great. Thanks. Um, I guess as a reminder to everybody, the uh, recordings will be available 
in about 15 minutes after we end this session. Um, the raw ones anyway, but you can continue to kind of uh, browse them and scrub through it on Loudswarm. And that's it. Um, there, there's a question. Can we have the finished notebook? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll post that into um, the Slack in a moment here after the cloud. Of course, I'll share the finished notebook. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone.